I'm pleased to be with you here uh, this morning, and I want to thank the ETS for uh, accepting this paper proposal. Uh, this comes from uh, out of my doctoral research, uh, looking at uh, John Cassian, a fifth century monk. So uh, many of you have the, uh, the paper, so you'll be able to read along with me. John Cassian has a reputation for being one of those semi-Pelagians. Semi-Pelagians could be described as follows. While not denying the necessity of grace for salvation, they maintained the first st steps towards the Christian life were ordinarily taken by the human will and that grace supervened only later. The Evangelical Dictionary of Theology explains that for the semi-Pelagians, the initial movement towards salvation could be performed by the unaided will. Finally, Arminian theologian Roger Olson holds that Cassian believed that people are capable of exercising a good will toward God, even apart from any infusion of supernatural grace. There are many others who have described the semi-Pelagians in this way. In this paper, I show that in analyzing Cassian's views regarding poverty and coveting wealth, we can see that these descriptions are inaccurate. First, I will describe Cassian's view on poverty, coveting wealth, and his description of this struggle with sin. Second, an analysis of Cassian's homartiology demonstrates the depth of human despair and inability to attain salvation from sin. As such, third, I argue this inability requires the necessity of divine grace to overcome. And not just for the sin of coveting, but any good action. If this conclusion is sound, then Cassian ought not be affiliated with the semi-Pelagian moniker. Born into a wealthy Christian family from Scythia, the traditionally believed location of his birth, around 360 AD, John Cassian received a good education, becoming fluent in both Greek and Latin. When he was a boy, he spent time in a monastery in Bethlehem with his friend Germanus. From there, at a youthful age, they traveled to Egypt to learn more about monasticism. It was there that he became committed to the ascetic teachings of the Desert Fathers. As is evident in two of his works, the Institutes and the Conferences, there remain disagreements as to why he left. But with Germanus, the two moved to Constantinople, where he was ordained by John Chrysostom. The two then spent several years in Rome, where Germanus died. Cassian had become friends with Leo, who would eventually become Pope. In the final season of his life, Cassian moved to southern Gaul, where he founded two monasteries in Merasai, modern, uh, or what would be called Massilia back for the, uh, the ancient Romans. One for men and one for women. Monasticism was growing in Gaul, but had been at present without monasteries. And also, it lacked guidance. Richard Goodrich writes, every ascetic did as he or she thought fit, following the whims that appealed to an untrained mind, rather than looking to a broader framework of established practice. Cassian, unlike his contemporaries, who spoke more theoretically, provided practical guidance for the renunciation of the world and sin. For these things cannot possibly be taught or understood or kept in the memory of idle meditation and verbal teaching. For it depends entirely upon experience and practice. Edward Gibson observes that, as a disciple of the Desert Fathers, Cassian's long residence in the East and his intimate knowledge of the monastic system in vogue in Egypt made him at once looked up to as an authority and practically as the head of the movement which was so rapidly taking root in Provence. Immature Gallic monasticism required order and obedience. Cassian's wisdom provided the bedrock for it. In Cassian, we have a person conversant in matters both East and West, and this provided him an opportunity to bring his Eastern experience to the fledging monastic movement in Gaul. The scriptures contain a number of passages pertaining to selling one's assets for the benefit of the poor or the community. Most, if not all, of us view these passages as descriptive, in some cases hyperbolic and not universally imperative. Cassian believed they were literal and imperative in order that we might be free from the sin of coveting. Cassian writes, writings reveal an author who is interested in the inner battle that each human encounters. This battle against sin could be described by eight categories, 
gluttony, fornication, covetousness, anger, sadness, sloth, vainglory, and pride. Seven of these seem to have their commencement, as it were, congenital with us and somehow deeply rooted in our flesh and almost coeval with our birth, anticipate our powers of discerning good and evil. Humans contain carnal impulses, which themselves have a useful purpose implanted in our bodies by the providence of the Creator. These impulses can be utilized inappropriately, and this leads to sin. But there is one of these deadly sins which arises from outside the body, from the free choice of a corrupt and evil will, as envy and this very sin of covetousness. Unlike the other deadly sins, covetousness is external to the flesh. Cassian tells a story of a monk who becomes enticed by money. He thinks he does not have enough funds given his meager living as a monk. So he takes up a side hustle. I, I paraphrase that. He takes up a side hustle in order to uh, prepare for a possible future in which he falls ill or must travel away. He acquires the coveted coin and becomes tormented for many reasons. He wants more. He does not know where to store it, and he does not know what to purchase with it. The power the coin has over the monk continues to grow and ultimately results in the worship of an idol. The monk's temperament begins to change as his greed begins to affect other virtues. Since he has kept his new earned wealth a secret from the abbot, he now has to begin telling lies he has to continue keeping up appearances as a monk, so he continues to complain that his shoes and his clothes are worn and needing replacement. And when a new monk, who truly has nothing, receives shoes or clothes, the greedy monk becomes engulfed with jealousy. Resolute with his plans to depart the monastic community, Cassian continues, and not content to take his departure by himself alone, he never stops corrupting as many as he can by clandestine conferences. In this description, it becomes clear that to the monk, he cannot remain in the monastery. It becomes clear that to the abbot, this monk cannot remain in the monastery. And so the abbot gives the monk the boot, figuratively speaking. But the monk's story does not end there. Outside of the monastery, he loses track of the daily religious routine. He begins seeking other means to feed his avarice. Soon enough, he is lonely, and with his money, uh, soon enough, he is lonely with his money, and he seeks a woman to preserve his hoard. Thus, the monk's love of money resulted in numerous instances of evil. In his fifth conference, Cassian also describes the eight cardinal sins. Therein detailing three types of coveting. First, that which hinders renunciants from allowing themselves to be stripped of their goods and property. This we might call internal coveting, the desire to not give up or give away what one owns. Second, that which draws us to resume with excessive eagerness the possession of the things which we have given away and distributed to the poor. This I call a regretful form of coveting. You have something, you give it away, and now you regret it and you want it back. Third, that which leads a man to covet and procure what he never previously possessed. This is what we think of when we think of the concept of envy. We might want the newest phone or a Tesla. How might one prevent or rid themselves of any of these three types of coveting? One attempt, as Cassian observes, is that there are some people who justify holding their belongings by giving some of them away. This will not succeed, thinks Cassian, who instead opts for full renunciation. Wherefore, if we want to obey the gospel precept and to show ourselves the followers of the apostle and the whole primitive church, we should seek out the discipline and system of a monastery that we may in very truth renounce this world preserving nothing of those things which we have despised through the temptation of want of faith. Hyun Ki Na notes, Cassian literally follows Jesus' words, especially his command to go, sell your possessions, and give money to the poor, and follow me. Thus he is suspicious of the flexible and optimistic idea 
that human desire for money can be governed so that wealth can be used for good. For Cassian, the accumulation and subsequent distribution of wealth was insufficient for avoiding coveting because the issue goes deeper than the objects external to one's self. And so we must not only guard against the possession of money, but must expel our souls the desire for it. In his first conference, Cassian teaches that even a vow of poverty is insufficient for avoiding coveting. The monks still do it. But poverty was seen as a necessary condition in the ongoing battle. And from this, it clearly follows that perfection is not arrived at simply by self-denial and the giving up of all our goods and the casting away of honors, unless there is that charity, the details of which the apostle describes, which consists in purity of heart alone. In other places, and with robust biblical framing, which we don't have time to get into here, Cassian makes a case against covetousness, particularly within the Cenobium. How then could one overcome this sin? While Cassian does have a reputation for a more optimistic view of human nature than the later Augustine of Hippo, and by later here I don't mean uh, after Cassian, I, I mean the later Augustine, his views shifted over the years. While Cassian does have a reputation for a more optimistic view of human nature than the later Augustine or Augustine of Hippo, we should take a moment to consider just how grave the situation is for the human in Cassian's framework. As a monk, Cassian was no foreigner to recognizing the drastic weakness of the human body and will. Cassian's spiritual doctrine places particular emphasis on the fragilitas of human nature and on man's total dependence on divine grace at every stage of ascetic progress, from God's initial call to the attainment of the purity of heart, says Raoul Marin. In this section, I will describe Cassian's sense of sinfulness by pointing to remarks about human carnality and inability, two features of Cassian's view of original sin. The first sin, which had terrible consequences, occurred as a result of pride, gluttony, and vain glory. It was a sale which makes us carnal. It was by Adam's ruinous transaction and fraudulent bargain we were sold. For when, we, for when he was led astray by the persuasion of the serpent, he brought all his descendants under the yoke of perpetual bondage. Cassian continually describes the first sin as an ill-advised transaction, false advertising, or a bad deal. The consequences of this bad deal were quite drastic. That is, all of Adam's posterity were born into slavery. The original curse made humans carnal and condemned us to thorns and thistles, and our Father has sold us by that unhappy bargain so that we cannot do the good that we would. The good that Cassian has in mind is the recollection of God Most High, which for him is a state of being. He does not mean here that humans are unable to do any objectively good action. We are often even against our will troubled by natural desires, which we would rather know nothing about. Being troubled implies that there is something good remaining in the will of each human. According to Sandra Folk, though the desire for evil is strong, the desire for good still exists. This then isn't an Augustinian picture of total depravity, but it certainly isn't close to Pelagianism. Augustus Neander concurs by observing that Cassian departed altogether from the Pelagian system by recognizing the universal corruption of human nature as a consequence of the first transaction. This corruption results in the carnality of the flesh and the warring between the body and the soul. Conference 4 describes the war inside of a person a battle between their soul and their flesh. And since these two, vis-a-vis -vis the desires of the flesh and of the spirit, coexist in one and the same man, there arises an internal warfare daily carried on within us. So, the fifth century monk warns, one must not allow outside spirits to control one's thoughts, else there would not remain any free will in man, nor would efforts for our improvement be in our power.
The freedom of the will is critical toward weighing between the two forces. And yet, free will does not afford someone the means of living a sinless life. Whoever dares to say that he is without sin, therefore, claims for himself an equality in the thing that is unique and proper to him, Christ alone. This impossibility of the sinless life confirms that in Cassian's mind, there is a firm propensity towards sin. Despite this very free will of ours, which is more readily inclined to sin, is turned by him to a better purpose, and by his prompting and suggestion, bent towards the way of virtue. This strong inclination affects even our daily tasks. Which of us, even at the moment when he raises his soul in prayer to God on high, does not fall into a sort of stupor, and even against his will, offend by that very thing from which he had hoped for pardon, pardon of his sins? Who, I ask, is so alert and vigilant as never, while he is singing a psalm to God to allow his mind to wander from the meaning of Scripture. One might consider cases like this trivial, but to the ascetic, seeking perfection, it becomes a serious concern. As dreadful as the fallen human nature is, there is an upside to the carnality of the flesh. Marin describes that in Cassian's thought, the flesh rebels against the spirit to warn man of his total dependence on the grace of God and prevent his vanity. The carnal desires are like a warning message to the soul to point and direct it toward God. This certainly leads to the observation that post-lapsarian humanity retain some of the goodness of God's creative act. Otherwise, there would not be a struggle. Owen Chadwick rightly notes, the carnality in man, which is the result of the fall, has not made man incapable of doing good. It has rather produced a tension in human nature, whereby the sinful desires pull against the spiritual desires. The later Augustine's version of inability could be described as the position that humans are non posse non peccare in a meticulous sense. Every action an unregenerate human performs is ultimately sinful because human nature was entirely corrupted at the fall. Quote, in the teaching of the doctor of grace, the effects of the fall are far more radical for man has by the sin of Adam lost any power of doing good. His will towards the good has perished utterly with the consequence that without the grace of God, there is nothing but depravity. End quote. Quote, far from sharing Augustine's views on the total annihilation of man's capacity for good, end quote, it could be said of Cassian that humans are also non posse non peccare uh, in an ultimate sense, but vis a vis the inevitability of sin, not meticulously. Cassian's version of inability is that humans are unable to attain salvation of their own accord. Like Augustine, Cassian's doctrine of inability is grounded in his view of the fall. Marin astutely observes, man's inability to attain the highest good to which human nature must aspire, the perennial co contemplation of God, is also a consequence of original sin. Because the state of humanity is in such a way that humans are unable to earn their own salvation, they are utterly dependent upon divine grace. Cassian introduces Conference 13 as a way of understanding that divine grace is needed for the attainment of chastity, because human effort is unable to do it alone. Likewise, salvation from coveting is, unable, is unattainable on one's own accord. We know Cassian either rejected or would have rejected the late Augustinian model of inability, because in Chapter 12 of Conference 13, Cassian specifically argues against one version of inability that is awfully similar to, if not identical with, the Augustinian one. He thinks, We should not hold that God made man such that he can never will or be capable of what is good, or else he has not granted him a free will, if he has suffered him only to will or be capable of evil, but neither to will or be capable of what is good of himself. 
In saying this, Cassian is speaking in a present perspective that God's presently created order includes humans able to choose between good and evil. The view of inability that he is critical of is sufficiently absurd and altogether alien from the Catholic faith. Lest we be tempted to think this alternative version of inability uh, to, constitutes Pelagianism, for Cassian, grace is necessary for salvation because the human will is inadequate to merit salvation. Cassian showed great interest in how monks ought to emulate Christ. He also showed great interest in how God graciously shores up the inadequate human will, and he frequently stated his case in anti-Pelagian terms. Cassian's most ferocious attack against Pelagianism occurs in his final work on the Incarnation. In Book 1, Cassian wrote that an error of the Nestorians sprang from the error of Pelagius, vis-a-vis -vis, that in saying that Jesus Christ had lived as a mere man without any stain of sin, they actually went so far as to declare that men could also be without sin if they liked, for they imagined that it followed that if Jesus Christ, being a mere man, was without sin, all men also could, without the help of God, be whatever he, as a mere man, without participating in the Godhead, could be. Since the Nestorians believed that there was a distinct person, Jesus of Nazareth, with a distinct human nature, who was without sin, then, Cassian argues, any human could be without sin which is Pelagian. For him, what is explicit in Nestorian Christology was implicit to Pelagianism. Cassian argues that in the Incarnation, humanity receives the gift of grace from Jesus Christ. But this grace cannot come from a mere man, for fragile earthly things cannot possibly furnish a thing of lasting and immortal value, nor can anyone give to another that in which he himself is lacking nor supply a sufficiency of that. It becomes clear that in, uh, on the Incarnation, Cassian presents a view of the fall that sin has entered into the world in a drastic way, which necessitates a savior for every person. In the conferences, he elucidates, however much then human weakness may strive, it cannot come up to the future reward, nor by its efforts so take off from divine grace that it should not always remain a free gift. This is Cassian's sense of human inability. With regard to overcoming the sin of coveting, Cassian's position on the renunciation of wealth was far from a sufficient condition. It certainly was a necessary one. But the human will, left to its own devices, if that were even possible, could not win the war against the law of sin. For it is impossible for a man to win a triumph over any kind of passion unless he has first clearly understood that he cannot possibly gain the victory in the struggle with it by his own strength and efforts. Not only could success in the victory be unattainable, but the battle could not even be started were it not for the grace of God. For there is no doubt that in all of this you could not possibly have succeeded unless you had been fortified and protected by the help of the Lord. For Cassian, divine grace was required for overcoming sin, but all the more so for every good action. Contra Gibson and others, Cassian accepted the necessity of initial grace. First, that divine grace was necessary for the completion of salvation is evident from Cassian's remarks about the ascetic life. For the Gallic monks, salvation was a process which was to be worked out only with the help of God. In his Institutes, Cassian advises that none can attain the end of perfection and purity except through true humility, believing that without his protection and aid extended to him at every instant, he cannot possibly obtain the perfection which he desires and to which he hastens so eagerly. For we ought to believe not merely that we cannot secure this actual perfection by our own efforts and exertions, but also that we cannot perform those things which we practice for its sake. Without the assistance of the divine protection and the grace of his inspiration, which he ordinarily sheds abroad in our hearts, either through the instrumentality of another, 
or in his own person coming to visit us. Consider the contrast here with Pelagianism, which held that an individual could attain salvation from her own merits. Chadwick observes, Cassian never suggests that sin can be overcome, that the Christian road can be traveled, unless God grants his grace. Finally, in Conference 13, Cassian writes of the seeds of virtue of God's creative act. But unless these are quickened by the assistance of God, they will not be able to attain to an increase of perfection. The human will is inadequate to merit or even start salvation and thus had need of divine grace. Yet to reject the role of free will in Ordo Salutis would be erroneous to him. The notion that everything was of God struck the monks as ridiculous, absolving humans of the responsibility the monks took so seriously. Yet their conviction regarding the need for grace was equally strong. If grace didn't already flow, there was no hope since the passions were so strong. And lest one took pride in the struggle, there was the continual reminder of the soul's utter dependence on God's grace. That we may miss this fundamental framework is largely due to the fact that for them, it was taken for granted. We look at their focus, human effort, and see only that. Divine grace was essential to the monk's order of salvation, but not in the same way as Augustine. Cassian treats grace not so much as a divine gift recreating the whole nature of man, but as an indispensable tonic, a curing rather than a transforming force. Grace was presumed, it was taken for granted. Grace was necessary for salvation. Second, we also see in Cassian's framework that divine grace was necessary for every good action, including the beginning of salvation. And therefore, Though in many things, indeed in everything, it can be shown that men always have need of God's help and that human weakness cannot accomplish anything that has to do with salvation by itself alone, that is, without the aid of God. Yet in nothing is this more clearly shown than in the acquisition and preservation of chastity. For Cassian, free will was not a self-sufficient system, but one that necessitated God's grace. It would, therefore, be more appropriate to describe Cassian's view of free will as the provenience of the first grace. Interestingly enough, this appears to be the same view that Augustine previously held prior to his own shift on nature and grace. So it would not be surprising to find, as Rebecca Hardin Weaver shows, that there is agreement between the earlier Augustine and Cassian on the necessity of grace even to the extent that they cite some of the same passages from the scriptures. Cassian believed that God's grace precedes the divine call, and when he sees in us some beginnings of a good will, he at once enlightens it and strengthens it and urges it on towards salvation, increasing that which he himself implanted or which he sees to have arisen from our own efforts. And note here that this or... uh, is perhaps not an exclusive use of or, but inclusive, meaning both and rather than either or. In Conference 3, Cassian asserts that the goodwill of each human comes from the Lord. And this plainly teaches us that the beginning of our goodwill is given to us by the inspiration of the Lord when he draws us towards the way of salvation, either by his own act or by the exhortations of some man or by compulsion It is our own power to follow up the encouragement and assistance of God with more or less zeal, and that accordingly we are rightly visited either with reward or with punishment. If Cassian's view on the necessity of divine grace for the initial steps of salvation still be doubted, further on in that same conference, he states that he puts into us the very beginning of salvation and gives to each zeal of his free will but that when we do not always resist or remain persistently unwilling, everything is granted to us by God. And that the main share in our salvation is to be ascribed not to the merit of our own works, but to heavenly grace. Finally, in his concluding remark in Conference 13, he lifts up the authority of the church and church tradition. And therefore, it is laid down by all the Catholic fathers 
that the first stage in the divine gift is for each man to be inflamed with the desire of everything that is good, but in such a way that the choice of free will is open to either side. All of these statements depict a man who does reject the notion humans could take the initial steps of salvation apart from divine grace. Overcoming the sin of coveting was a twofold formula. The human must renounce all the possessions of the world because, by the grace of the Lord, you were for this purpose made ready that you might hasten to him the more readily, being hampered by no snares of wealth. As we have shown, Cassian believed that divine grace was necessary not just for the completion of salvation, but for all good actions, which include the willingness to believe. It would be inaccurate, as I have demonstrated, to say that Cassian rejected the necessity of grace for the initial steps of salvation, or for any stage of the salvation process. In their etymological survey, Bacchus and Gudrian conclude, while this description of the content of semi-Pelagian beliefs corresponds to what later generations of scholars took semi-Pelagian to mean, it does not actually describe the historical reality of the movement or movements. Today, the semi-Pelagian moniker is a boogeyman in contemporary evangelical Protestant theological circles, used to convey the notion of a heretical position. As I have argued in this paper, Cassian's view on coveting wealth describes for us the depth and extent of human carnality and inability for avoiding sin. Overcoming this sin, or for any good action, necessitates divine grace. And if Cassian's doctrine of grace indicates the necessity of grace for the first steps of salvation, then he should not be considered a semi-Pelagian. Indeed, no Gallic monk with surviving works from the 5th or 6th century should. Thank you.